Thank you. Sai Ram. It is a pleasure to be here. I visited Boston years and years ago. I couldn't have been more than seven or eight. And so I don't remember a lot about it, except I visited an aunt and uncle for the summer, and all I remember is that they bought me pretty clothes to go back to school. <laughs> you know, when I'm asked to do these things, a lot of people will say certain prayers and do certain things, and, and I do thank Swami humbly for this opportunity to serve him in this capacity and to serve all of you. But most of the time when I get ready to do this or anything like it, I do something very simple. I say, okay, Swami, showtime. And then all I have to remember is the show is about him. It's his show, not mine. You know, I appreciated Brother AJ yesterday, and he, he talked about, um, if not me, who? If not now, when? And if I'm going to make the connection to Swami, I need to do it. I need to stop reading about it and talking about it. I need to make the connection. It's important. And in, before the introduction, you know, sometimes when I hear that introduction, I think, who are they talking about? <laughs> Grammys and all this kind of stuff. When they first asked me to come up with something to say for people to say about me, I thought, oh, there's nothing to say about me. I'm about as ordinary as dirt. And then people started to remind me, well, didn't you do this? And I said, oh yeah, I did that, yeah. And didn't you do that? And I say, oh yeah, I forgot about that, I did do that. And then all of a sudden, I had this introduction. But every time somebody reads it, I thought, I think to myself, really? <laughs> That's me? They're talking about me. <laughs> so. I'll, I'll give you a little introduction about my first experience with Swami, and then I'll get into, I have become a teacher, sort of. I homeschool five nieces and nephews. And uh, so when I do things, it tends to come off like a lesson. And that's what this is probably gonna sound like, a lesson. But in this lesson, I am the person learning. So I'll start off with a story that, of how I first heard about Swami. It was talked about just a little bit briefly. I had a friend, I belong to a universal foundation for better living church, which in the name, it's universal, it's new thought. And so this is how I believe I was open enough to even hear Swami's name. And a friend of mine in this choir, a dear friend, very sweet lady, she was reading a book one day. We were, we were BFFs. She was, we always sat beside each other. We hung out together. And she was reading this book one day in choir rehearsal. And I was kind of reading over her shoulder. And you know, you, you're not on the same paragraph with her, so she turned the page. And I started reading the next page. And I asked her, I said, what are you reading? So in order to bait me, in order to get me to ask questions, she said, oh, it's a book about the avatar. And she moved on. So I said, OK. Never heard the word before. And I said, OK, I'll play along. So I said, what is an avatar? And she did it again. She said, well, an avatar is the full incarnation of God. Okay, what does that mean? So I asked her, I said, well, what does that mean, full incarnation of God? And she said, well, 
That means God is here on earth in a body. Well, that piqued me. And I must have asked her two or three times, what do you mean God is here on earth in a body? And she's just repeated it. I mean, God is here on earth in a body. So I'm thinking, you know, in metaphysics, you say God is everywhere, in everybody, in everything, all the time. So I thought that's what she was referring to. So I said, oh, so you mean there is no spot where God is not in all the little, you know, things that we used to say about God. And she says, no, I mean God is here on earth in a body. Well, the last time I said it, she repeated slowly as if I was mental. <laughs> I said, well, what, what does that mean? And she said, God is here on earth in a body. <laughs> and I said, and my, you know, my, my, everything in me was buzzing. And I thought, really? That's what that book is about. Well, as she was reading it, and in my life, I don't know where I got these, this understanding from, but as she was reading it, I was thinking, okay, she's reading a book about Rama and Krishna and all these you know, deities that I didn't even know were supposed to be real. I thought they were just stories. And I said, so this book you have, it's about Rama and Krishna and all that, right? She says, no, it's about Satya Sai Baba, God in human form in a body. Well, I'm very intrigued now. And so I said, so where do I get a book? And she told me, well, do you want one? I'll bring you one. The next week, she brought me Sai Baba Avatar. And I was determined I'm going to read this book and I'm going to figure out what all this is about. And so I never used to go to work and you know, go to lunch and talk and you know, gossip and do all that. I would find a quiet corner and read. So I took my book and I went to the washroom which had a nice lounge in it. And I opened my book and I started reading. And she had told me, she said, well, we have a group, small group of people on the south side of Chicago and we meet on Fridays at seven o'clock and we have some videos, you're welcome to come. She left it at that. So I went to the lounge and I opened the book and I started reading. I got a little nervous. And I closed the book and I thought to myself, you know, you don't even have Jesus down pat. What are you doing? Now you're gonna jump over here and jump around there. Next thing you know, you're shaving your head and just following some cult. You don't know what you're doing. Stop. So I closed the book. And a voice as clear as I'm speaking to you now said to me, there's no need to fear. There's only one. I'll never forget it. And so I thought to myself, well, you're a pretty normal person. You're not prone to run off and do silly things and join groups and cults and all this kind of stuff. That's not what you're about. So read the book. And when I opened the book, you know how uh, a picture, the paper is a little different from the other pages. So when I opened the book, it fell on Swami's picture. And around the edges of his picture, my eyes could see the face of Jesus. It's not in the picture, it's what I was seeing. The voice came back to me. There's no need to fear, there's only one. Suffice it to say, I read the book in about two days and it was a little bit before Friday. So I showed up at the address that she had told me on Friday at seven o'clock and I rang the doorbell and she was the one who answered the door. And she stood there and looked at me like I had just stepped off a spaceship 
And I said, it's Friday, isn't it? And she said, yeah. And I looked at my watch and I said, it's seven o'clock, isn't it? Didn't you say seven o'clock? And she said, yeah. And I looked at her. And then she said, oh, I'm so sorry. Come in. Oh, I'm just so surprised that you came so quickly. Most people, you have to beg and you have to, you know, threaten and you have to do all kind of stuff to get them to come. And she said, I was just surprised that you came so quickly. So I came in. There were about maybe 10, 12 people. And they were eating and talking. And then she said, oh, we're going to show a video after everybody is done eating. They showed the video. I don't really remember which one. I've been trying to remember which one. But it was a, it was very quiet video. And it was just of Swami walking around, taking letters, really quiet video. And nobody made a sound while it was on. My mouth hung open. My chest got full. And when the video was over, it was so funny. When the video was over, the entire room turned to me. You know, because I was the new person in the room. So when the video was over, everybody's head turned to me. So my friend asked me, so what did you think? The first thing came out of my mouth was, how do I get there? I need to get there. How do I get there? What do I do? So that was my first introduction to him. Later that year, there was a conference, the first, con well, my first conference, retreat. And I was washing dishes one day in my house. And my, my wall behind my sink was a bunch of yellow and green flowers, little yellow and green flowers. And I started thinking about, I had heard stories, People always told me these stories about these wonderful, miraculous things that Swami had done and all of this. Now, I call myself a chocolate drop from the south side of Chicago. And things like that didn't happen to me. I'm just a chocolate drop from the south side. So I kind of got emotional because I kept thinking to myself, OK, here I go again. Oh, I'm going to hear these wonderful stories, and I'm going to read about these wonderful stories. I want to experience some of these wonderful stories. So the conference was coming up. We were all going to go. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask somebody to bring me my purse, because this is a good spot for this. We went to the conference, and Dr. Hislop, if, if anybody remembers, everybody should remember, thank you. Everybody should remember Dr. Hislop. He was the keynote speaker at that particular conference. And so they introduced him. And I was a little way in the back, and I got up on one knee and took a picture. And the conference was wonderful. Everything was great. It was fabulous for my first conference. It was a wonderful thing. I went home, and I, at that time, you didn't have all these fancy phone cameras and all of that. I went home, and I took my reel to Walgreens to have it developed. So they developed. I had taken a bunch of pictures. And they developed the pictures. And I was in Walgreens. And I opened my packet, and I started thumbing through my pictures. And I was, oh, that was nice. Oh, that was pretty. Oh, that was sweet. And then all of a sudden, I gasped. I mean, a real, oh! And the lady behind the counter said, ma'am, are you all right? What, what happened? Are you OK? And I, it took me a minute, and I said, I'm great. I'm fine. Because the picture that came out when I took the picture of Dr. Hislop, I'm going to pass this around, and anybody can, you can look at it if you want, was this huge orange light that was not in the room when I took the picture. And of course, we know what the orange represents. 
but it was this huge, I've had people examine the picture, I've had everybody talk about the picture. I was so excited, this was my first, the first idea that Swami was telling me, I got you. You're not gonna be in the back, left out, I got you. This was my first idea that that was happening. And I've had professionals look at the picture. It's in the negative. And, but it was not in the room that day, not visibly. So I was so excited about this experience that the very next retreat that I went to, I made 500 copies. <laughs> And I took them to the retreat, and when I told the story, the first person that said, oh, can I get a copy? Yes, you can. <laughs> and I grabbed my bag with my 500 copies and passed them out to everybody who wanted one. So I'm just gonna pass this. You can look at it if you like. Dr. AJ spoke yesterday, and he, he, he talked about himself as a podiumless speaker, I, am tell, I tell you now, I'm grateful for this podium <laughs> because nobody has to watch my knees shake. So this friend of mine, you know, I'm one of these people who I love music. I've always loved music from a little kid. People used to pay me, you know, a quarter. Family members would come over. They'd pay me 50 cents to sing Aretha Franklin at six. You know, so I've always been involved in music. I have a thing that I do where I take, I, I listen to any, any music. I can listen to gospel, I can listen to classical, I can listen to opera, and I can listen to rap. Not really. <laughs> Nobody's gonna buy that. I, I, I'm listening to rap. But I love any kind of music. And I tend to take songs that I love and I'll switch the words to fit who I love, which is Swami. And this next, this, what I wanna do right now is sing a little song for you. And I'll tell you a teeny weeny bit about it and we'll get into it. It's called, The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face. It's a beautiful song written and sung originally by a lady named Roberta Flack. Only I made the words fit what I was feeling. So I'll do that right now. Siron, I don't hear it. Little technical difficulties, bear, bear with me. You may have to start it over. Okay, you want me to just continue talking? Okay. Okay. There's a song that goes along with the video and we're having a Few technical challenges, thank you, Swami. <laughs> he always presents me with technical challenges. But anyway, the, uh, and I'm, I'm so grateful for the, the theme of this conference, because whenever I do this, being the teacher mind, I do a lot of research, which helps me immensely, teaches me. And that's what I did for this talk. I researched what Swami talks about duty, as well as other quotes about duty. 
and I, you know, pondered it, and I thought, what about, you know, my duty? All that comes into play. So when these opportunities come up, that they're teaching opportunities for me, we all think we know about love, but do we really? We all think we know these words when they, when we say them, we say them kind of nonchalant duty. But do we really know if we delve into the word, it's a little word, but when we delve into that word, do, did we really know what that word meant, what it really means, what duty really means? So my talk this week, this today, is the research that I did and the things I came up and what I wanted to share with everybody about duty. I'll be, f oh, it's ready? Okay.
your face your face your face your Thank you. That is my favorite, favorite song. Whoever wrote that song, that's just ridiculous to me. <laughs> How people, where does that come from? That is just so ridiculous that that can flow through a person, melody, lyrics, and make a song like that. So now I want to get started on duty. And, the, and, and ma, uh, Mama Dharma, duty. I, had, I started out with a quote from Swami, duty, what is exactly your duty? Let me summarize it for you. First, tend to your parents with love and reverence and gratitude. Second, speak the truth and act virtuously. Third, whenever you have a few moments to spare, repeat the name of the Lord with the form in your mind. Fourth, never indulge in talking ill of others. And finally, do not cause pain to others in any form. This is from Satya Sai Baba Sadhana, The Inward Path. So I want to talk this weekend about duty as it pertains to Swami's five human values. Truth, right conduct, peace, love, and nonviolence. There's a quote from Pope Francis. This could be a quote from anybody. But the quote came from Pope Francis that says, we all have the duty to do good. Everyone has the duty to do good. Today's world, the world we live in today desperately needs devotees to rise up and learn their duty. It, duty seems to be a word, simple words like discipline or abstinence or temperance, words that have all but vanished in this world, in this society, because it replaced with words like wars and rumors of wars. That's what the Bible said, that one day there would be wars and rumors of wars and that's exactly where we are. Duty is about what one ought to do. Uh, its root meaning is to owe, to owe something, to owe, or what is due. And it deals with heart motives and purpose for living. So, it gives one, it, it talks about one's reason for certain kinds of conduct. And duty also includes responsibility and the responsibility to discover your talents, your assets, your abilities, your skills. And the, everybody has valuable skills. It doesn't matter whether they're huge or simple. Everybody has a skill that is valuable to this society and to this world. We need to utilize these attributes and continuously improve them for God, for self, for family, and for society. 
and from Mother Earth. Each person's destiny is shaped by their own choices, their own deliberate selections and rejections. Every person is the sum total of all the choices that they have made in all of their lifetimes. And that's why it is our duty as devotees, as spiritual beings, to our world and to Swami's legacy, to know what our duty really is. Whenever, like I said before, whenever I'm required to speak, I feel it's my duty to be aware as much as possible about the subject that I'm going to speak about. So this past few weeks, I have done everything I could, read everything I could about duty and how people perceive duty so that I could talk about it. So this became my call to duty. Therefore, what I'm doing this weekend is simply sharing that information that I found, that I came up with. And as a homeschooler, everything is going to come out like some lesson. But I looked up a few synonyms of the word duty. Responsibility, obligation, calling, liability, and burden. And I like to use other words like requirement and necessity as well. The one that kind of surprised me is burden. I never would have thought burden would be duty, the same as duty. But when you think about it, you know, you don't want a burden. You don't think of duty as this heavy load, this burden. So that one kind of surprised me. But when you think about the word burden, it's just as equally a definition of duty as any of the other words. If we substitute the word burden for duty, which really is the truth, then we'll, we have to understand that whatever God places before us, no matter how frightening, no matter how harsh, no matter how seemingly unfair, it is our duty to do it and do it well. You, we, we, we as humans have this capacity to categorize things. Well, this is kind of uncomfortable, so I'm not going to consider, I'm, I don't want it. I don't want to do it. It's not really very joyful. I don't want to do that. And that's what we tend to do. But anything that God places before us in these lifetimes is duty, is our duty to do it. And, and so what tends to happen, well, in the Bible, it talks about, Christianity talks about Jesus' duty. You know, much like Jesus' lament before, during, and even after the crucifixion, Christianity notes that this suffering and this torture that Jesus experienced was his duty. Now that's kind of strange. Because then you can start naming a whole lot of other suffering and pain in the world and call it duty. They say the cross was his calling. The cross, bearing this cross, and that's just not dragging the cross, but this whole thing that he went through, was his calling. The cross was his burden to bear 
for the sins of the world. That's what it teaches. And it also teaches us that Jesus prayed and asked God to spare him this frightening, painful, torturous duty. And we all have done that. We all have prayed for release. You know, it's a, it's a common thing. Jesus prayed, take away this bitter cup, meaning I'm not feeling it. It's scary. It's harsh. Maybe we could skip it this time. But no such thing. It was his duty to bear the cross. And he was Jesus, the Messiah. And if he prayed for release, then what about me? I mean, you know, many times we, life is a journey. It has a lot of suffering. It has a lot of joy. And so you, you can't really, I mean, Jesus prayed to take away this bitter cup, so I'm, I'm okay. I used to say when people used to ask me, so Crystal, how are you? And I would say, well, they haven't nailed me to a cross yet, so I'm doing good. I'm okay. And right here, I want to sing another song for you. And this is about Jesus' lament and his journey. It's an old song. I think this song was written in 1955. I probably was two or three. And I don't need music for it. I typically sing it without music. So bear with me. The song is called, If Jesus Had to Pray. If Jesus had to Sleep. 
sleep. Then Jesus spent the night in prayer. Oh, can't you see him? lying there if Jesus had to about me thank you beautiful song beautiful old gospel way back in 1955 I think it was written still pertinent today I had a minister, my minister was an extraordinary woman. Tall, I bet she was six foot five. Staturesque, just gorgeous. And she used to say things like, she used to tell us, the way she used to teach was interesting because she used to do things like, if you say, oh, you know, um, this is holy ground. And she would say, and what is that over there? And you'd say, okay, well, you're used to saying certain things. You used to saying, well, take off thy shoes for thy, this is holy ground. And she would say, okay, so the ground over there, what is that? And she used to tell us, there is no spot, this was her favorite thing to say, there is no spot where God is not. So everywhere you go, everything you do, the air you breathe, everything is God. Because you know, we do like to categorize things as humans. This is not a good person, really. Then you, it's the, the, the problem lies in your eyes, not in the person. The Bible says, behold, his eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. Well, we're not quite that pure. We still see good and bad, up and down, black and white. We still see it. But it is our duty to learn, our duty to this world to society, to Swami's legacy, is to learn what our duty is. And our duty is to have eyes too pure to behold iniquity, to behold anything other than God. And duty determines virtues and vice versa. Virtues determine duty. The virtuous life that you lead determines your duty. And the duty that you perform determines the virtuous life. Duty is a sort of commitment, committing yourself to do good. And, and, do, and do whatever it takes to create that virtuous life, whatever it takes. And to share that life that you've created with the world. Swami talks about this all the time, be of good character. Be of good character. 
My minister also used to say something that I'll never forget. When you talked about character, she used to say, listen, you may be the only Bible anybody ever reads. You may be the only Bible anybody reads. No pressure. <laughs> but you have to carry yourself accordingly. You have to live an according life. You want people to say, I, I once, this is a true story, I once had a person walk up to me and she said, oh my God, you just had this light, you just got all this light going on around you. And she said, what, what do you do? What? Do you meditate or something? And I said, well, here's the story. I said, I have been to see God. And all that drama you see is his heart and your heart connecting. It's what is the truth. You have to move through your life thinking of Swami all the time. So that people who have never heard his name and never seen a picture will know something is going on within you and they will want to know what that is. This is the duty, this is our duty as human beings, as spiritual beings, as devotees having had the tremendous grace of knowing Sai Baba in the form. And Sai Baba teaches to build this character through those five human values. And we have to delve deeper into the human values. I, I could point to anyone in this room and they can recite them. And most of us on the surface know what they mean. But a lot of us are not necessarily willing to go the full nine yards in performing those duties. Some, I once told somebody I was talking and they were talking about nonviolence. They were all oh, the violence in all the violence that's going on. And we, were, we started talking about nonviolence. And so she says, oh, um, you know, I don't understand how people do this. I don't understand how people shoot each other. I just don't get it. And there was a quote by Martin Luther King that said, nonviolence is not about just not shooting a person. It's about not hating a person. And I don't know where I read this, but I read once that if you see something violent happening and you don't do anything about it and you don't get involved and you don't call the authorities, you do nothing, then you have participated in the violent act. That stunned me. Not that I would not have done everything I could at that time, but it stunned me that that was the truth. We are all part of each other. When one hurts, we all hurt. We have to look at our duty that seriously, that deeply. You can't just sit back and say, um, that's them over there. Them over who, over where. That's you, that's us, that's all of us. We're in this together. And if we don't look at it that way, we will perish. We're in this together. And this love that we feel, all this 
connection that Swami has given us, this love, this affection, we should be willing to share this with everybody. Don't you want everybody to feel this way? We have to look at this as our duty to share Swami's legacy with everybody, everywhere. Truth, right conduct, love, peace, nonviolence. Now, when we get ready, you know, to do service projects, and I really enjoyed that clip about the service projects. Sometimes, not us, quote, us, <laughs> but sometimes when something is presented to you as a duty or a service, you might say, um, why do I need to do that? I don't have time. I don't feel like it. It's too far. It's too hard. It's scary. I'll just write a check mail it off. And that is a service too. But we have to stop being afraid of real service, real duty. I'm not going over there, over where? Where God isn't? So, you know, if you, it, 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 it's a process. It is a process, I agree. But it is a duty that must be done. And I remember a story about, I read this somewhere. It may have been in Swami's teachings. I read a million books. And he, it, was, it said that Swami puts the, the poor and the downtrodden in our presence so that we can do our duty. We can lift them up. We can learn to care. We can learn humility. Now, try to explain to a poor person that it is their duty to be poor. Good luck. And at the same time, try to, you know, it's not a thing where you could say, it's your duty. You, you can't hurt people or do anything like that and say, well, it's my duty to do this to you, and it's your duty to accept it. Not how it works. You get hurt really fast. That's not how duty works. That's how some people think. Even in our country, we convince our citizens to go to war as their duty. And according to my definitions, and that, what, that I looked up about duty, that's not the way it is. You know, we, we convince them that this is our duty. And these situations come, you know, a, a world that is lacking in duty is a world of greed, self-centeredness, selfishness, rebellion, chaos, anarchy and war. That's a world without duty, that lacks duty. I mean, what kind of world do we want to live in? How much worse do we want it to get? But we convince our people that fighting these wars is their duty. Well, it seems to me it's just the opposite of duty. I mean, do we want to continue to create this world? And according to Swami, according to Swami, we are God. 
I've heard it from his own mouth on several occasions. When, Pete, when Swami says, who is, who is Swami? We all want to say, oh, Swami, you're God. I've heard him on several occasions say, no, you are God. I took that statement and I wrestled with it a little bit because I'm kind of a kooky God. But in reality, in the truth, everything, and this is going to maybe shock a couple people, but everything in this world we create. Now we want to put the blame on something else. But everything we in this world we create and we continue to create it with our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. And when I thought about that, I thought, okay, I've heard, you know, there are things that you do, I call myself an ignorant God. Because I don't know that I am the creator. I have not learned yet that I am the creator, meaning all of you, not just me, we're all one. And so the more negative news we watch, the more sensational TV we watch, all these, uh, what do they call these shows, reality shows that we watch, that goes into the mind, into the heart, and into the world. And then we wonder, what kind of world are we in? What kind of world, but we don't know, it's the world we create on a daily basis. This life we live is a privilege. God gave us a privilege. This was offered by God and therefore this privilege, it is our debt, our duty to live a life to glorify God. The motive for duty is love. Love kind of underlies everything. But the motive for duty is love. The Bible says in John 4, 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. And it says also, ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. That means put your feet in the right direction and think on it, know it, and all your ways will be established in that. The devotee committed to his duty might fall once in a while, but he quickly gets up and he keeps going. Like the young people say, keep it moving. Whatever happens, keep it moving. The devotee committed to his duty is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. They shall not be swayed. You shouldn't let anybody sway you from the duty that's been placed on your heart. The committed devotee knows that he must do his duty as defined by God's word on his heart. Regardless, I remember the first time I went to Puta Party, there was a huge sign in the canteen that said, the truth is the truth, even if there's nobody but you speaking it. And a lie is still a lie, even if everybody is doing it. That takes commitment in this world. In this world, it takes commitment to do the right thing amidst all this drama and trauma. The goal of duty 
is, a, is for personal satisfaction and contentment knowing that what is good and right has been done and that society has been improved. <clears throat> you have to have a personal satisfaction that what you are doing is the right thing, that the world is being improved, not that I'm getting paid, somebody is complimenting me, but it's the right thing. Thing to do and that will always always make the world a better place so there are five categories of duty duty to God duty to yourself duty to the family duty to society and duty to Mother Earth and they all are intertwined and based in love I, I believe that this external world we live in is the absolute result of a lack of the understanding and fulfillment of one's duty. And when you think about duty, what it means and how it can be accomplished, then you can see if you really think about, well, if had I been doing this all along and had I understood this, what a world we would have been living in. What a place, what a transformation this world would take on if we only understood, committed ourselves, and fulfilled our duties. So duty, little bitty word, but packs a lot of power. Simple word, but packs a lot of power, can literally transform a nation, a world. And when, and, and when I say understanding your duty, you do have these government officials that think they know what duty is, but it's all about the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the wars and rumors of wars. But if we truly understood duty and we spread that understanding to the world, there would be no need for wars. There would need be no need for any kind of conflict at all. My minister used to say, listen, don't covet another person's good. That's, you gotta, you pray to a narrow God if you do that. If you see another person in a beautiful dress and you, oh, I wish I had that, then you believe in a God that doesn't have enough. And that's not the God I wanna serve. You have to think big. You have to believe in God's omniscience omnipotence and omnipresence, everywhere evenly present in everybody. There is no spot where God is not. So I want to thank you all for listening to me. I hope I didn't bore you. It's been a pleasure being here before you. Your bright faces in Swami's garden helped me not to be the slightest bit nervous. And I am grateful to be able to serve you and serve Swami in this capacity. Thank you very much. Sayon. So